Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Bhutang dhammang sanggang namasam. So continuing with readings from Buddha Dhamma by P.A. Paiuto, translated by Robin Moore. And I appreciated the discussion <coughs> yesterday, and I thought actually to start by reading a parts of a sutta, excerpts from a sutta in the Anguttara, Anguttara Nikaya called Modes of Practice in Detail. And this is a translation by Ajahn Jeff. It's from Handful of Leaves, Volume 4. And uh, it on page 154. And it talks about four modes of practice and it might be helpful to, for some people to just give an overview that when the Buddha talks about these four modes of practice, there's, uh, whether practice is painful or pleasant, or slow intuition or quick intuition, is Ajahn Jeff's translation. Um, it seems whether it's painful or uh, pleasant depends on uh, the, uh, the strength of one's greed, anger, and delusion, or passion, aversion, delusion. And whether it's uh, quick or slow depends on the strength of the five faculties. And I'll just read some excerpts from this. Monks, there are these four modes of practice. Which four? Painful practice with slow intuition. Painful practice with quick intuition. Pleasant practice with slow intuition. And pleasant practice with quick intuition. And which is painful practice with slow intuition? There is a case where a certain individual is normally of an intensely passionate nature. He perpetually experiences pain and distress porn of passion. Or he is normally of an intensely aversive nature. He perpetually experiences pain and distress born of aversion. Or he is normally of an intensely deluded nature. He perpetually experiences pain and distress born of delusion. These five faculties of his, the faculty of conviction, the faculty of persistence, the faculty of mindfulness, the faculty of concentration, the faculty of discernment, appear weakly. Because of their weakness, that he attains only slowly the immediacy that leads to the ending of the effluence. This is called painful practice with slow intuition. And there's also painful practice with quick intuition, pleasant practice with slow intuition, and then I'll skip to the last one, which is pleasant practice with quick intuition. And which is pleasant practice with quick intuition? There is the case where a certain in individual is not normally, is normally not of an intensely passionate nature. He does not perpetually experience pain and distress born of passion. Or he is normally not of an in intensely aversive nature. He does not perpetually experience pain and distress born of aversion. Or he is normally not of an intensely deluded nature. He does not perpetually experience pain and distress born of delusion. These five faculties of his, the faculty of conviction, the faculty of persistence, the faculty of mindfulness, the faculty of concentration, the faculty of discernment, appear intensely. Because of their intensity, he attains quickly the immediacy that leads to the ending of the effluence. This is called pleasant practice with quick intuition. These are the four modes of practice. Now, resuming Buddha Dhamma, and I thought uh, maybe just to read the last um, seven lines or so of what Adinyaka read, just to refresh, and it gives a nice summary. It's talking about a gardener, who's somebody who's working on a, a gardener. 
If the gardener has no true desire for the plants to flourish, he will not love his work. Rather, he will have to force himself to work. The work will thus be burdened with a sense of suffering. This is one of the vital problems for people in the present age. As civilization develops, people's suffering increases. People's work activity and education is beset by suffering because they are caught up in this system of preconditions. They are caught up in a system of craving. And now today's section B, uh, and this is page 51, B, uh, system of preconditions in harmony with natural laws. This is of course chapter 11, happiness. Craving is normally accompanied by two other factors. As a group of three, these factors are referred to as papanchadama, mental defilements that cause complication, proliferation, and perturbation. Here are simple definitions for these three factors. Tanha, the desire to obtain. Mana, the desire for prominence. Ditti, narrow-mindedness, attachment to personal views and beliefs. These three defilements focus and center on one sense of self. They are factors of selfishness. They cause problems within a system of preconditions. Whenever they act as the force behind a system of preconditions, they cause all sorts of confusion and turmoil. The problems are not limited to suffering inherent in people's work and education. Every sort of human problem is caused by these defilements, leading to distress and agitation. An awareness of these three defilements enables one to find a solution to problems. The solution lies in applying one's intelligence to find ways for human conventional laws to link up with and support natural laws. Clever people establish conventional laws which help lead natural dynamics in a direction producing results consistent with their desires and objectives. If we want a tree to grow, then we provide the necessary care, like pruning, watering, and adding fertilizer. Through division of labor, one organizes a gardener to, vote, to devote his time and effort to this task. One reassures this person that in respect to earning a living, one will provide an adequate income. Here the gardener needs not be anxious and can fully devote himself to this work. In this way, one establishes a bridge between human conventions and natural laws enabling people to create optimum causes and conditions aligned with natural dynamics. If the gardener possesses wholesome enthusiasm, he wishes to see the plants flourish, and he wants to act in order to bring about this state of completion. If he is reassured about sustaining his livelihood, he can devote himself fully to this task. In this way, he experiences happiness and receives a salary. The work is successful and the worker is happy. In this way, the system of human regulations is coordinated with the causal dynamics of natural laws so that they proceed effectively in line with the wishes of human beings. If, however, the gardener is devoid of a wholesome enthusiasm, acting as the catalyst for natural dynamics, the work will not be successful. If he acts simply from craving, desiring only the results promised by a system of preconditions, he will be unhappy because he will have to force himself to work, and the gardening work itself will be unfruitful. If this lack of wholesome enthusiasm is prevalent, all human systems and institutions will be distorted, imbalanced, and corrupted. Work will be unsuccessful and people will be unhappy. Moreover, when people are devoid of wholesome enthusiasm, and dominated by craving, they do not exert themselves in their work. They avoid their work and are dishonest and deceitful, giving rise to corruption and waste. The consequence is that one must emphasize secondary systems of supervision and control. When craving takes hold of these systems of supervision, new overlapping systems of control need to be established. The three defilements of perturbation, papanchadama, 
then cause further turmoil and distress. In the end, human society is led to ruin and calamity, as is described in an old Thai poem, when the bot is spent, the tiger dies. And there's a footnote here, which is interesting. Uh, from the poem, Loka Nite, translate, written in 1831, so uh, add that it seems one bot was worth quite a lot in 1831, and uh, it was one bot equaled 100 satang. So the story goes that a zoo acquires a tiger for which one bot is allocated each day to keep it well fed. The keeper responsible for feeding the tiger embezzles 25 satang each day. When the director notices, the, notices that the tiger is not filled out, he sends an inspector to find out what is going on. When the inspector discovers the truth, he demands 25 satang as hush money from the keeper. The tiger get, gets thinner prompting the director to send a more senior inspector. He too demands 25 satang as hash money, and the tiger t is soon just skin and bones. <laughs> the director sends the chief inspector, but he demands the remaining 25 satang for himself, causing the tiger to perish. So, as described in an old time poem, when the bot is spent, the tiger dies. For this reason, it is important that a system of preconditions does not destroy or crush wholesome enthusiasm. One needs to be alert and use one's intelligence to ensure that the system of preconditions supports wholesome enthusiasm, which mobilizes desirable natural processes. In today's age, which is dominated by systems based on greed, it is still possible for wholesome and virtuous development to occur. Because enough people possess an adequate degree of wholesome enthusiasm, even if this is not always obvious, we need to prevent a system of craving from becoming the dominant dynamic which eclipses wholesome enthusiasm until it gradually recedes and eventually disappears. Instead, we ought to make wholesome enthusiasm the mainstay. Although craving may still cause some trouble, people will, re will retain an adequate degree of stability and safety. It is necessary to acknowledge that human systems of preconditions are the driving force in the world. What are our options when we realize that people exist at different levels of spiritual development and that most people are still committed to a system based on craving? It is not sustainable for people to simply follow their desires. It is essential that people responsible for establishing this system of preconditions are endowed with wholesome desire and that they ensure that wholesome desire is given a prominent role within such a system. Moreover, they should set down decisive measures of heedfulness for all people to use while engaged in developing themselves. This key subject of desire tends to get overlooked. It is vital that one is able to distinguish between wholesome and unwholesome desire. When one has understood this matter, it will be easy to determine how to solve problems, and one will develop happiness with confidence. And the last reading I'll do will be a reading uh, about, uh, I guess you can see is related to wholesome desire. And this is another translation by Ajahn Jeff. Uh, from the Anguttara Nikaya to Anguttara Nikaya 3, number 40, Governing Principles, and this is on page 25 of Handful of Leaves, volume 4. There are these three governing principles. Which three? The self is governing principle, the cosmos as a governing principle and the Dhamma as a governing principle. And what is this self as a governing principle? There is the case where a monk, having gone to a wilderness, to the foot of a tree, or to an empty dwelling, reflects on this. It is not for the sake of robes that I have gone forth from the home life into homelessness. It is not for the sake of alms food, for the sake of lodgings, 
or for the sake of this or that state of future becoming, that I have gone forth from the home life into homelessness, simply that I am beset by birth, aging, and death, by sorrows, lamentations, pain, distresses, and despairs, beset by stress, overcome with stress, and I hope perhaps the end of this entire mass of suffering and stress might be known. Now, if I were to seek the same sort of sensual pleasures that I abandoned in going forth from the home into homelessness, or a war sort, that would not be fitting for me. So he reflects on this. My persistence will be aroused and not lax. My mindfulness established and not confused. My body calm and not aroused. My mind centered and unified. Having made himself his governing principle, he abandons what is unskillful, develops what is skillful, abandons what is blameworthy, develops what is unblameworthy, and looks after himself in a pure way. This is called the self as a governing principle. And what is the cosmos as a governing principle? There is the case where a monk, having gone to wilderness, to the foot of a tree, or to an empty dwelling, reflects on this. It's not for the sake of robes that I have gone forth from the home life into homelessness. It's not for the sake of alms food, for the sake of lodgings, or for the sake of this or that state of future becoming, that I have gone forth from the home life into homelessness. Simply that I am beset by birth, aging, and death, by sorrows, lamentations, pain, distresses, and despairs, beset by stress, overcome with stress, and I hope, perhaps, the end of this entire mass of suffering and stress might be known. Now if I, having gone forth, were to think thoughts of sensuality, thoughts of ill will, or thoughts of harmfulness, great is the community of this cosmos. And in the great community of this cosmos, there are contemplatives and Brahmins endowed with psychic powers, clairvoyant, skilled in reading the minds of others. They can see even from afar. Even up close, they are invisible. With their awareness, they know the minds of others. They would know this in me. Look, my friends, at this clansman, who, though he has in good faith gone forth from the home life into homelessness, remains overcome with evil, unskillful mental qualities. There, all, there are also devas endowed with psychic power, clairvoyant, skilled in reading the minds of others. They can see even from afar. Even up close, they are invisible. With their awareness, they know the minds of others. They would know this of me. Look, my friends, at this clansman who, though he has, in good faith, gone forth from the home life into homelessness, remains overcome with evil, unskillful mental qualities. So he reflects on this. My persistence will be aroused and not lax. My mindfulness established and not confused. My body calm and not aroused my mind centered and unified. Having made the cosmos his governing principle, he abandons what is unskillful, develops what is skillful, abandons what is blameworthy, develops what is unblameworthy, and looks after himself in a pure way. This is called the cosmos as a governing principle. And what is the Dhamma as a governing principle? There is the case where a monk having gone to wilderness to the foot of a tree or to an empty dwelling reflects on this. It's not for the sake of robes that I have gone forth from the home life into homelessness. It's not for the sake of alms food, for the sake of lodgings, or for the sake of this or that state of future becoming that I have gone forth from the home life into homelessness. Something that I am beset by birth, aging, and death, by sorrows, lamentations, pain, distresses, and despairs, beset by stress, overcome with stress, and I hope, perhaps the end of this entire mass of suffering and stress might be known. Now the Dhamma is well taught by the Blessed One, to be seen here and now, timeless, inviting, verification, pertinent, to be experienced by the observant for themselves. There are companions in the holy life who dwell knowing and seeing it. If I, having gone forth in this well-taught Dhamma and Vinya, were to remain lazy and heedless, that would not be fitting for me. So he reflects on this. My persistence will be aroused and not lax. My mindfulness established and not confused. My body calm and not aroused. My mind centered and unified. 
Having made the Dhamma his governing principle, he abandons what is unskillful, develops what is skillful, abandons what is blameworthy, develops what is unblameworthy, and looks after himself in a pure way. This is called the Dhamma as a governing principle. These are the three governing principles. And then it ends with verses. There is in the cosmos no secret place for one who has done an evil deed. Your own self knows, my good man, whether you are true or false. You underestimate the fine witness that is yourself. You with evil in yourself that then you hide. The devas and tathagatas see the fool who goes about off pitch in the cosmos. Thus you should go about self-governed, mindful, governed by the cosmos, masterful, absorbed in jhana, governed by the dhamma, acting in line with the dhamma, the sage who makes an effort in truth does not fall back. Whoever through striving, overpowering Mara, conquering the ender, touches the stopping of birth, is such a knower of the cosmos, wise, a sage, unfashioned with regard to all things. So these are reflections for this morning. Any questions, comments, reflections? Uh, give encouragement not to give up if you have unwholesome thoughts, even if you know the devas can see them. And, uh, because they will give their anemone if they know you're making an effort at eventually gaining insight into them. But uh, I think what it's pointing at is not giving in completely and just not not cultivating mindfulness at all or not putting forth effort in the practice. So it's using the cosmos as witness. I know a lot of monks who do that. I'm reminded of a certain tune that goes, uh, he knows when you come down your door. So, yeah, good, for goodness sake. It's uh, Santa Claus, the Deva. Dharma Claus. <laughs> yeah, you can, you can make aspirations like that, but um, it's, it's rare that a person, it would take somebody who has that power to be able to see them to verify that that's working, but you can make aspirations like that, or you can ask forgiveness from the devas if you want to train your mind to overcome, say, certain unskillful thinking. You can, you can actually ask, ask forgiveness from them, and then at least you'll feel better about it, that you've done what you can, you're putting forth an effort. But certainly uh, making intentions to devas, that's very, very common in Asia. You know, please help me with something. Spirits, devas, nagas. Uh, Kristen. Uh, what, what does unified mean in terms of unified mind? Because in English, unified means usually taking two qualities or more and combining them. Is it? I think it's in the suttas, ekagata unification or one pointedness but it's a it's a gathering together and a non non dispersal yeah. of the mind oh yeah it just says so he reflects like his when he's encouraging himself he says my persistence will be aroused and not lax my mindfulness established and not confused my body calm and not aroused my mind centered and unified that's probably a one possible translation of ekagata, which is, I think of it as like a non-distraction or a collectedness, uh, balance, uprightness. It's interesting too that on the governing by the cosmos, cosmos, he reflects thus, there are tathagatas and other beings, devas, or who know my mind. I thought that was kind of a unusual phraseology. It's a extremely hot and bitter controversies around things like this. And like, uh, can Buddhas come and help you after they pass away? 
Well, it's, yeah, it's a big controversy about like the Ajahn Mun biography, about Arhants going and giving advice to Ajahn Mun and teaching him. Like, well, no, they're gone. They, they can't, that's impossible. But then my, my take on it is, it, there's one sutta where somebody is asking the Buddha about Arhants and Buddhas after death. And um, the Buddha says, well, if you say they're gone, that's nihilism, that's wrong view. You can't say they're gone. You can't. You, he, the actual phrase is, "You can't say they don't exist." He says, "Well, then they exist." And the Buddha says, "No, that's eternalism. That's the wrong view of eternalism." So, uh, but they, whatever you could conceive them by, has ceased to exist. So, uh, and then the Buddha just sort of leaves it at that. So, I, I like to think of it with this open-mindedness, like that. It's a potentiality. Anything is possible. Yeah. It's interesting, like in the writings and teachings of Ajahn Mahabua, like just won't be nailed down. Same as the Buddha. Mm-hmm. On like, what is it? The ultimate? How does it work? It just at any time, someone says, "Well, it's this, right?" He just will say something, you know, and then throw curveballs like that out mm-hmm. there. I appreciate that. And it's like most of the teachers that I've, that I've heard or met are similar. When you try to like, like, okay, well, what is it? What's the about? Mm-hmm. Is it this? It's this, right? You know, they always like, this won't be so undefinable. You can't, you know? Yeah, like, a, you know, an arhat couldn't possibly come to you or help you. They're gone. Right. So like, uh, but uh, the Buddha, in either it's either that sutta or another one that's similar. He says, their state is vast, vast, profound, and deep, like the great ocean. So he, he ends it with that, like that. To, there's a profound quality to it. This is my own fanciful notion, but I like to think of the, the Tathagatas going through eons, perfecting their virtues, and when they die, they neither exist nor not exist. If you think of a virtue like generosity, where is the, where does it exist? Is it in the gift or is it in the giving? It's, it sort of neither exists nor does not exist. So if you are virtuous, you see the Buddha and maybe the Buddha sees you. And if you're not virtuous, you don't see the Buddha and the Buddha doesn't see you. Well, the, all the qualities are all connected, but the thing is you, you also can't say they neither exist nor not exist. Mm-hmm. That's the... You, the quadrilemma. You can't say they exist. You can't say they don't exist. You can't say they both exist and not exist. And you can't say they neither exist nor not exist. Uh, but uh, that's the, the the one where the Buddha uses the analogy of the questioner says, well, what happens to a Tathagata after death? Do they exist? But it says not valid. They not exist, not valid. Both exist and not exist, not valid. Neither exist nor not exist. Not a valid question. The guy's like, well, that doesn't make any sense. The Buddha says, well, let me ask you a question. When you blow out a candle, where did the flame go? Did it go north? And the guy says, well, that's not valid. Did it go south? Did it go west? Did it go east? And the guy says, well, that's not valid question. The Buddha says, where did the flame go? And then the guy says, well, the flame is temp- simply termed as out. And so the Buddha says, well, you answered your own question. The Tathagata is, after death, is simply termed as having gone out. <laughs> and then that's, that's when he has the phrase that the, their mind is deep like the, like the ocean. But it, uh, in terms of like generosity or different qualities, yeah, you could intentionality, you could think of things like that too. Although when there's intentionality, then you say either bright or dark, comma, then you're still within samsara. So bright, comma, leading to happy states, dark, comma, leading to unhappy states, but it's still within the realm of becoming. But then there's the comma that's created by the Noble Eightfold Path, that's the imperturbable comma, or the comma leading to the ending of comma. So 
then uh, say like an arhant can still act like Prabhupada talks about having chanda, but it's but it falls within that imperturbable kama where it doesn't it doesn't necessarily have a bright or dark result. It's within the sphere of of uh, acting. You can say they have intention, but it's it's a perhaps a profound kind of intention where it doesn't result in any form of rebirth or becoming. But it's not that like an arhant is just suddenly like they just sort of slump over and become blank. And that they, uh, they still act and act even more, act with the perfect balance of, of intentionality and energy. And, but then there's the parinibbana where they, they pass away and then, of course, having the body and mind passing away. So then, then there wouldn't be that that form of acting or intentionality. It's fun to think about, but not too much. Don't want to think about it too much. Yeah, even somebody uh, asked Longpur Piyak about the Ajahn Mahabua writing the Ajahn Man biography controversy about the Arhants coming and giving Ajahn Man advice. And, and uh, Lumpur Biak was also kind of vague in his answer. He said, he said uh, something like, they came in the form of visions, something like that. And that was it. Uh, and, some, and then they like ask it, the questioners like, well not, so they were, they were visions, they were just visions, right? they were just his visions. And, and Lungpur Biak still saying something like, you know, you know, yes, it appeared as a vision, something like that. <laughs> so, so.